μετά από το σεμινά, από το συνέδριο α, το Cortical Development, στο οποίο παρουσίαζε, που γινόταν στα Χανιά. Ε, να σας πω δύο λόγια για το βιογραφικό του. Έχει τελειώσει στο, την, α, α, το φαρμακευτικό τμήμα α, στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Αθήνας. Στη συνέχεια έχει Master σε Neuroscience και PhD σε Neuroscience από το Πανεπιστήμιο της Οξφόρδης, όπου δούλεψα με τον Μάρκο Καφόνια στο, στο Anatomical Pharmacology κάπως, yeah, Unit yeah. του MRC. Ε, πολύ γνωστό για τη δουλειά που έχει κάνει α, με η ηλεκτροφυσιολογία των Interneurons. Α, στη συνέχεια α, υπήρξε για δύο χρόνια fellow στο MRC, στο ίδιο Unit, και από το 2007 είμαι fellow στο, στο Neuroscience Center του, του NYU Medical Center και δουλεύει α, δίπλα στο Gold Fischel, επίσης πάρα πολύ γνωστό για τη δουλειά του σε Interneuron Development. Uh, οπότε ο Θεοφάνη θα μα μιλήσει για mechanisms of uh, cortical interneuron circuit formation in health and disease. Οπότε θα πάνε σε αυτήν. Στα χέρια. Θα ευχαριστήσω. Θα κάνω μια. Δεν ξέρω, δε, ε, όχι τόσο και μπορεί να το ήθελα, ήμουν δύο μήνε μετά που έφτασε το PhD στο Μάρκο. Mm. Όχι δύο χρόνια. Mm. Yeah. So um, I'd like to also extend my condolences to uh, to the community for the loss of your colleague. And I'd like to thank you for having me here uh, today uh, on this uh, occasion to talk to you about the mechanisms of cord plantar neuron circuit formation in health and disease. So this is some of the work that I've done in uh, Gorky Shell's lab at NYU. Uh, uh, which actually focuses on, on uh, interneuron development, uh, cortical interneuron development. <clears throat> and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about how I, I became interested uh, in, in this type of work and then present to you some of the data that is now just uh, published uh, and some which have not yet been published and, and we're working towards that. And at the very end, I'll present, uh, uh, you know, Uh, um, a tip about how I'm thinking of proceeding uh, with this work in the future. So, uh, to the question of uh, why you know anyone would be interested in, in circuit formation, the development of the circuit, and specifically that of interneurons, um, one can actually reply uh, in the following way: uh, because we can we can better understand the adult brain if we if we know how it has been built. Uh, because the same principles in players exist throughout life, for example, plasticity and growth factors. Uh, and also because early insults can severely impact later function. Um, that's particularly true for interneurons, which is the, the subject of my study, that have been shown to be essential for normal development and function, uh, and as well as, uh, as the fact that their, uh, their malfunction has been implicated in devastating brain disorders. And this, in fact, is how I, I became interested in neuroscience, because uh, I was auditing some, some classes uh, on, on, on uh, you know, different diaphages and schizophrenia and devastating brain disorders. And I was very intrigued about like, uh, trying to find out uh, the underlying mechanisms for these disorders, which, in fact, uh, affect the core uh, human uh, features, most of which, in fact, lie in the, in the cortex. So, That's, that's how I actually decided to, uh, to go for neuroscience and study the cortex and specifically study interneurons uh, since they have also been implicated in, in disease. So um, one can, can actually uh, group interneurons in different ways. Here I'm showing you just uh, a few of the types that have been uh, described so far uh, based on their intrinsic electrophysiological uh, properties. Oh, sorry. I don't know if this is visible, but uh, so um, uh, so yes, these are some examples of, of types of interneurons that have been described for interneurons in the literature, and we have also uh, you know studied. Uh, um, and this is by no means an exhaustive uh, uh, you know account of, of the different types uh, described. 
Uh, but basically, I group them in terms of uh, fast to slow. Uh, and, and the reason why I've done that is, is just to illustrate to you the extremes uh, you know, that, that one can find uh, present in the cortex, even just by looking at the intrinsic electrophysiological properties, which in fact are how the neuron responds in terms of action potential firing when you depolarize it uh, with a step, a uh, current step. And on, on the one hand, you have, on one extreme, you have uh, fast spiking cells, FSLs, uh, which actually fire uh, in a very robust way, immediate and robust way, with very narrow action potentials. And this is important for the function. I'll go a tiny bit into that in the next slide. And on the other hand, you have the so-called late spiking cells, which in fact, as you can see here, fire uh, a little bit late upon, uh, as a response to a depolarizing step right here, and their action potentials are a bit uh, wider than, uh, than the fast spiking cells. So I actually studied in my PhD and, and in my postdoc uh, these two cell types, and the reason for that is also not only the, uh, because of the fact that they actually form the two extremes, and I, I, I thought that this would be informative in terms of how two extreme interneurons develop integrate and function the cortex, uh, but also because, especially for this type of cell, the so-called FSL, these are the pervalumin positive so-called basket cells, which have been, uh, are the most implicated interneuron uh, in, in disease, especially in schizophrenia so far. So these are the ones that I decided to focus on, and just a little bit of background on those. Uh, as I said, PV positive, pervalumin positive FSLs, are fast and efficient devices that can have an impactful control uh, over a neuron's output. Sorry, I don't think you can see the laser, the pointer, right? Do you use it on the other side as a... Yeah. Or just... Oh, I just go. Oh. <laughs> okay. Mm. No, sorry. Mm. <laughs> okay, well, so I'll be moving around a little bit more. Uh, but, um, Basically, okay, so these are the, uh, just a characteristic example of the morphology uh, of a basket cell. In black, you can see the dendrites and soma, soma uh, of, of this cell, and in red is the elaborate axon, uh, which actually forms baskets around cell somata uh, uh, and, and has a, a great influence on the output of that cell. So as you know, uh, uh, most actually cells uh, have uh, fire of action potential occurs at the axon initial segment, uh, and hence, something that actually goes and, and, and tackles that uh, initiation site uh, has a great uh, you know, influence over the output of the postsynaptic cell. And, and they do that by actually uh, eliciting very fast postsynaptic responses. So when they fire uh, that fast action potential that I showed you, they elicit very fast responses uh, and big. Uh, so then they are able to uh, immediately affect the output of the cell. On the other hand, the uh, uh, reading positive, uh, which is another marker used nowadays in, uh, you know, in parsing out interneurons, LSLs, like spiking cells, are slow devices. They have an impactful control over a neuron's input since they actually uh, um, um, target the distal dendrites of ground vessels, of excitatory cells in the cortex. Uh, and they do so by also uh, eliciting also quite big responses, as you can see there on the right. Uh, with unusual uh, uh, kinetics, unusual characteristics. These are um, one, maybe of two uh, cell types that actually elicit such slow responses, uh, which is postulated to have uh, differential effects on, on actually the um, um, impact of excitatory input in the dendrite. So these are the so-called neuroglyphorin cells. Uh, so I'll be talking to you a little bit about that. Um, and during my PhD work, I actually, you know, studied these cells and, and, and revealed some aspects of short and, and long-range uh, connectivity as well as input-output uh, function transformations. Um, but I was also humbled by the fact that even by studying small networks of cells, just two cells, like patch of two cells, recording them, seeing how they communicate together, uh, you know, it's such a wonderful and complex uh, thing to see. Uh, and it was at the end of my PhD that I decided to actually uh, um, join Lord Fischel's lab. And, and the reason why I did that is I thought for two things, for two reasons. I thought by going at earlier developmental time points, uh, I would be able to hopefully untangle 
uh, this complexity. So the question was, how do we you know, begin to untangle um, this complexity? So I thought, you know, if I go earlier, things might be simpler. You know, it's as the neurons uh, start developing and start elaborating and integrating to the, uh, you know, uh, circuit, I'll be able to have more of an insight about how how that complexity comes about, and also because. Uh, Words Lab has, has been doing lots of mass genetics and, uh, and uh, creating also tools and using tools to target different cell types, uh, which, uh, which I thought is very important in order to be able to uh, address, of course, the you know, integration and function of individual cells. And his lab, as well as others, including, uh, um, oh, here I, I had it in, but including Dorman's lab, actually, uh, has worked on the generation as well as uh, the um, uh, migration of interneurons into the cortex. So one of the characteristics of interneurons is that they're not generated at the same spot where excitatory cells are generated, which is basically the dorsal side of the cortex. They, in fact, are generated right here in the ventral side of the developing telencephalon. And if you forget about these LG, which do not give rise to cortical interneurons, but other types of projection neurons in the basal ganglia, uh, the NG, as well as the CG, the caudal ganglionic eminence and the medial ganglionic eminence, uh, are, are, together with a, a region right here, which is not shown, the POA, the preoptic area, are the structures which actually give rise to almost 100% of cortical interneurons. And in order for them to reach their final position, they have to migrate to their target. And they do that by um, engaging in this long tangential migratory stream, which Donna has studied a lot and knows a lot about. And when they reach that, uh, you know, uh, when they reach the dorsal structure, uh, what they have to do is basically dive in, uh, which is called the radial migration of interneurons into the developing cortical plate formed by excitatory cells there. And then they have to start integrating into the forming circuit. And at the end, they have to mature and refine. And when I joined this lab, I was a bit more interested in actually the latter processes, the integration, maturation, refinement. Because coming from a functional background, I was a bit more interested in how this, as I, as, I, as I told you before, complexity develops. And at that point where these events uh, seem to be happening uh, is when, in fact, the cortex starts being active, electrically active, um, during development. And so the question we asked when I joined his lab, uh, and just, this is like three slides of published work, is what is the role of electrical activity in the development of cortical interneurons? And if one looks into, into the cortex, uh, you know, this is a review published by Rosa Cossart's lab in France, uh, in Marseille, who's worked a lot on these issues uh, of population activity in the developing cortex. One sees different types of activities present. Uh, that starts off from a simple intrinsic activity where a single cell seems to be active, uh, you know, just by itself probably due to uh, calcium voltage uh, uh, sensitive calcium channels, uh, followed by gut junction coupling, so the cells are electrically coupled, and then by glutamate mediated activity, and at the end by GABA uh, mediated activity. Glutamate is the main excitatory uh, amino acid that you know, as you know, neurotransmitter in the cortex, and GABA is the uh, inhibitory uh, uh, neurotransmitter in the, in the cortex. Uh, so uh, we decided to focus our efforts at this stage because, because this is when the bulk of activity seems to be expanding and being mediated by uh, uh, neurotransmitters uh, such as glutamine. And in order to address the role of activity in, in, in specifically at that stage of development, we need to be able to target these cells. So uh, to do that, and to do that in a sparse and kind of cell autonomous way, we designed an experimental strategy by which we uh, uh, open the uterus of a, of a pregnant female and uh, uh, injected, I don't know how many of you may have heard of done this method, inject some DNA plasmid into the ventricles and then pass some current uh, uh, you know, uh, using two electrodes and then place the pups back into the uterus, uh, sorry, into the uh, abdomen and then let them grow. Uh, and, and in fact, we did that experiment um, where we injected a plasmid uh, that that, that uh, expresses the uh, GFP under the DLX56 um, enhancer element. And this uh, element, I don't know if you remember, actually, I didn't take you through, so I hear this is one of the uh, genes that has been, uh, was first described in interneurons. It's very specific to interneurons, the DLX genes. Um, 
And basically, we use that in order to get specificity of expression in interneurons and did the electroporations and the injections at E155, which we knew, I'm not showing you here, that is the peak of production of certain types of interneurons, cortical interneurons. And when we did that and analyzed that P8, uh, what we saw is we saw that sparse labeling, very bright sparse labeling of one hemisphere because it's a, a you know, um, unilateral uh, you know, in, uh, injection and, and basically current. Um, induction, and, and you see that very nice sparse labeling of interneurons, and I'm not showing you here, but we actually get uh, specific types of, of, of interneurons. Now, in order to address whether glutamate uh, plays any role in the uh, development and integration of these cells, we did a very simple and, 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 in a way, dirty experiment, which was amongst, which was one, in fact, of, of, uh, of many other experiments that addressed more cell autonomous in a cleaner way uh, you know, the role of activity, but at the end we concluded that basically it was worth doing this, uh, which was published, and we just uh, injected chimeranic acid, which is an antagonist for AMPA and NMPA uh, uh, receptors, uh, after electroporating these cells. And we did that in the cortex, so we opened a bit of a hole, subdurally injected this compound, and stitched it back, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, the, the skin and then uh, let the, let the uh, pups grow a little bit and uh, address their uh, development at P8. But what we saw is in fact that we, uh, we saw a significant reduction of the elaboration of, of axons and dendrites of, of these cells specifically, the really positive as I told you earlier from cells. As you can see, both the dendrites and axons are truncated uh, uh, in these cell types. Uh, but as a nice control, that's something which was unexpected, we saw that that's actually a specific effect or specific cell types. Not every interneuron shows that effect. And in fact, the VIP positive, which I haven't talked to you about, vasointestinal uh, peptide positive uh, interneurons, didn't show any defect. So there was something specific about these cells um, and that type of activity that affected their development. And this was all published. So. Uh, this is now work that we uh, were trying to get out, and, and we, uh, we followed this work up by, by asking the following questions. Uh, what are the possible uh, sources for glutamate? So this was a glutamate receptor blocker, but we have no idea where glutamate comes from, and we have no idea whether, in fact, uh, what we're just doing is blocking the receptors onto those cells. It was a generic way we blocked all receptors in the cortex, you know, we saw an effect, so reducing excitatory drive overall has that effect. So we, we basically asked, what are the possible sources for glutamate? Which are the cells that provide that? What are the possible receptors, specific receptors involved in this phenomenon? And what are the possible downstream genes activated by, possibly activated by this activity and receptors? So the first question to address this one, we turned into a recently, fairly recently developed method by the Calloway group where they, uh, they have developed uh, rabies viruses, uh, modified rabies viruses, to trace synaptic connections uh, in, a, in a one synapse away um, method, basically, you know, one synapse uh, method, which is basically what, you're, what that allows us to do is induce the genes of interest, and that we have to, I won't go into the details of explaining the method, but we can discuss about that, a bilateral operation again, perform the injections of the virus, the rabies virus at P3, and that allows the rabies to basically get into that cell and spread one synapse away backwards. So only the cells that are uh, connected to that cell, one synapse away, not every single cell, will be labeled in red. And the cell, the starter, so-called starter cell, will be labeled in, in, in uh, yellow here. And this is one example of a really positive in blue I don't know if you can see, electroporated cell that is also uh, infected with a virus. So what did we see? When we did that, in fact, uh, because of the sparse electroporation uh, and, the, uh, and the type of injection we perform, we actually are able to get down to a single cell, as far as we can tell, starter cell. So what we do is we section the whole the brain from roster, from, uh, roster to podo, and then we see how many starter cells we have and what we label presynaptically. When we do that analysis, we see presynaptic cells, so cells that connect to this in the cortex in the vicinity as expected, 
in layers uh, five, as you can see here, and upper layers. I'm not sure this is a most representative example, but we see also, of course, layer two, three. And this input has been described before, in fact, uh, by glutamate uncaging, by the Callaway group. Uh, and, but we also see some deep layer six neurons, which in fact is an interesting thing, because uh, uh, we, you know, we can talk more about that. Uh, uh, later on, but, but this is interesting. So we see a pattern that has some of which has been described before, but was, what was unexpected to us was the fact that we see early development, the first postnatal week, we see labeling coming from the thalamus. Uh, so the thalamus actually uh, is, is the sensory, uh, if you want, gate. So whatever comes, and I'm sure you know this, whatever comes to the uh, you know, a periphery actually goes to the thalamus, uh, and then uh, it's relayed uh, into the cortex. And it's been, it has been shown, of course, that the thalamus, as I said, projects to the cortex, but the main thalamus recipient layer is layer four, and whereas the cells that we're studying are, in fact, seeking the upper layer. And uh, this was a totally unexpected uh, you know, uh, finding, especially because just looking at the numbers of, of presynaptic cells, we saw that, in fact, uh, the majority of the cells seem to be actually coming from the thalamus. So the majority of the, the, the input that the cell receives during the first postnatal week come from the thalamus, rather than the intracortical sources. Which means that there may be a possible role for sensory-driven activity in modulating the integration of these cells, uh, which was an interesting hypothesis. So we went to test that by uh, trying to reduce the thalamic activity onto these cells. And to do that, we used two different methods. One was this uh, bit like a generic, but uh, quite widely used still um, way uh, by plucking, removing sensory driven information. Because we studied the somatosensory biological cortex. What that allows us to do is actually look, uh, look at the whisker system, which is uh, what is represented in the barrel field, as I said, of the sensory cortex. If we remove the whiskers, what we're able to do is actually affect the excitatory drive that reaches the cortex. So we did that, we electroporated and removed the whiskers from P0 to P8, and when we looked at what happens to these cells. And the other method we use uh, uh, is a genetic method. We use the driver line, only 3 cre which actually, as you can see here, fake map with a, with a reporter line gives us a very nice labeling of, of the thalamus. Uh, um, so as to be able to knock out transmission, uh, release, glutamate release from the thalamus. And to do that, we use the tetanus toxin line, so which blocks synaptobrevin, cleaves synaptobrevin, which is necessary for, for release, so there shouldn't be any glutamate coming out of the thalamic fibers. So when we do that, we have, uh, we see uh, that there is a disruption, uh, a bit of a disruption in the uh, formation of the thalamic action. Uh, as shown here by the U2 uh, staining. So uh, the staining is a bit more diffused in the sensory deprived one, and, uh, and, and a bit more so in the only three tetanus toxin line. Uh, but nevertheless, when we did some you know, stainings for layer markers, uh, such as, for example, CT2 shown here in green, we don't see any major layering defects uh, in the cortex by these manipulations. Now, what, how do our cells look like when we reduce that thalamic uh, drive? In fact, we see uh, what we saw before by, by using the blocker, that both the axon, especially the axon, <coughs> as well as the dendrites, are truncated both in the deprived as well as the, uh, the, the genetic cross, which tells us that there's something about the uh, sensory-driven activity that comes in which regulates this process of, of elaboration of axons and dendrites. Now, wanting to... Um, actually address whether this is specifically a thalamic issue or whether by reducing any type of excitatory drive that these cells receive, which we know as, as I showed you with uh, the rabies, comes also from the intracortical column, we want to address um, what the role of, you know, what the effect would be if we reduced activity. And we did that, um, we tried to do it genetically, but so far we have failed. Uh, you know, most of the animals seem to, uh, uh, you know, uh, die before we are able to do the experiments. Uh, we're still trying to find a nice method of doing it, but uh, in failing to do that, we turned into a, a virus expression. We use the EMX free line, which is specifically dorsal, and labels excitatory cells in the dorsal, and uh, and injected with the tetanus toxin, as I told you, 
it blocks release, uh, eGFP virus, AAV virus. And then this is how the whole mount looks like. This is a, 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 you know, an electroporating brain as, as shown there. Then we cut sections. We see where that is expressed. You know, you see that like nice expression of, of GFP, which indicates the expression of tetanus toxin. And then surrounding, uh, you know, in the midst of that, you see that red M cherry now electroporated itself uh, of interest. And look at the morphology. When we did that, uh, although it has its own caveats, we can talk about that. Uh, we didn't see the same defect as we see with uh, by reducing the line of activity. So that tells us that there seems to be some sort of specificity between the different types of excitatory drive that these cell received, um, uh, thalamic versus uh, intracortical. And uh, that could be due to the different uh, differential expression of receptors, for example, in the two, uh, the two input. Um, and to do that, we, uh, we turned uh, to test for uh, you know, the receptor composition and expression and try to understand how this you know, might be happening. Uh, we turned into uh, electrophysiology and optogenetics, uh, whereby we used um, uh, two different crosses uh, to try and get at basically the intracortical input versus the thalamic. For the intracortical, as I said, we use the EMX Cree line. For the thalamic, now we use the VPO2 Cree line. Uh, which has uh, uh, which has some some issues. Uh, we can talk about that, uh, in the, like later on if you want. But basically, we're able to dissect the two input by using two different driver lines in the same reporter slash uh, um, manipulating line, which is the channel rhodopsin, uh, you know, um, line. Uh, this is a channel rhodopsin basically flocks off in the Rosa Lock. So that means that Cree recombines the flux, as I said, and you have channel rhodopsin expressed in the axons of these two different inputs. So we cut slices afterwards and patched onto the cell in vitro, recorded it, and then, sh uh, uh, and then uh, shine light, uh, you know, uh, blue light to activate the uh, channel rhodopsin, uh, the channels. And when we did that for the intracortical ones, we observed the nice APA mediated response at minus 70, as well as a nice NMDA mediated response at plus 4. When we depolarized and blocked AMP receptors, we see also nice NMDA. When we perform the same experiment in the thalamic pathway, this is unfortunately, we have a more representative example now. This is a bit of an old example, but you see no difference in the AMPA uh, 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 response. It looks smaller there, but it's not on average. See, uh, so you do see amper mediated response coming from the thalamus, which validates the radius tracing, but you also see nice MDA res uh, responses uh, coming, you know, activated from being activated from the thalamic fibers. And um, the analysis that we've done shows that, in fact, when you do the ratios, because that's a way that we have to normalize between NMD and amper responses, uh, uh, as you can see there, the NMDA. Uh, um, seems to be larger in the, uh, in the thalamic pathway compared to the AMPA, uh, and also slower. So there, there seems to be more charge that is mediated through the NMDA receptors in the thalamic pathway. And in fact, just looking into that further, we wondered whether that could be because of the differential expression of certain subunits uh, in some of these receptors. And uh, the two most common subunits uh, that have been, you know, described to be present in the NMDA receptors, uh, in addition to the NR1, which is a necessary subunit, uh, are the NR2As and NR2Bs, and these have differential, uh, you know, um, they're they're distinguished by different stuff. Like the kinetics are slower in the NR2B, the deactivation time is slower, the developmental expression patterns is basically a higher earlier in development for the NR2B. It has been described before. Uh, the surface expression is more dynamic, but also in addition, they allow more calcium in, which is important for uh, downstream, uh, you know, uh, cascades, transcription regulation. And there are a couple to companies too, which is an important molecule for plasticity. So we wondered, in fact, whether that uh, difference uh, between the two pathways could be attributed to the uh, uh, um, enrichment of NR2Bs in the thalamic. And in fact, that's what we saw. We used a specific drug that blocks an NR2B containing receptor, <coughs> if I'm here. And uh, what we saw is when we did the same experiment, looked at the NMDA responses, used this drug, 
this drug has much more of the same concentration of an effect on the NMDA responses coming from the thalamus, as, as you can see in the graph, versus the, the intracortical, which means that there is an enrichment of NR2B receptors. Now, all this is good, but we needed to be able to test whether it is these receptors that are important for the effect we see in the morphological development of the cells. To do that, of course, what do you do? You knock them out. Uh, one way to knock out completely NMDA receptors and, and address that is basically by using a fluoxetine and NMD, uh, NR1 subunit, which is necessary for the formation of channels. And to do that, we use electroporation, use the, the same plasmid in addition to the uh, uh, CRE, base expressing plasmid, electroporate, co electroporate that and in the flux uh, uh, mice. And in addition, we, uh, sorry, this is basically to show you that the technique works and that when you look at the NMDA responses in these cells, you completely lose them. That's actually shown by the red one. So basically, uh, before you would have like a remaining uh, component here, when you block AMPA receptors, a plus 40, you're left with zero. So the technique works. NMDA receptors are completely lost. And in addition, we used an NR2B fluxed uh, uh, mouse and knocked out NR2B receptors. So when we do, I'll show you the overall analysis here. When we do these experiments, which are nice because they're cell autonomous, now they knock out the receptors, so the receptors that receive that excitatory drive, we see the same uh, developmental basically defect. We see a truncation of actions and dendrites, which is more or less similar between the NMDA receptors uh, complete knockout and the NR2B knockout. And we've done the experiment of the NR2A, uh, which is a straight knockout, unfortunately, and we, don't, we do not observe the same, the same defect, which, which tells us uh, that, in fact, um, it's the thalamus that you know, activates these receptors that are necessary. Now, so far I've talked to you a little bit about, not a little bit, I've talked to you about how activity regulates the morphological development. Uh, but what would, be, what would be interesting to see is whether, in fact, that drive is necessary for an instructive, in a way, for the proper integration of these cells. And in order to do that, and to, you know, um, answer that question, uh, we turned again to the rabies virus. And we, we did it, of course, in control conditions, but also in the NMDA receptor knockout. And when we did that, what we saw was, was very interesting. We saw that you uh, almost completely ablate the thalamic input. When you knock out NMDA receptors, um, activated from the thalamus, supposedly, uh, based on the experiments I've showed you, the data, you lose that input. But what you do is you, you seem to be gaining some of the intracortical input. So there seems to be some sort of an antagonism between the intracortical one and the thalamic ones. Uh, we don't fully understand it, and I think it will be very interesting to, uh, to address these issues in the future, as, as, as you will see. Some of the experiments you know, I'm thinking of doing are, are to address that. Uh, but there seems to be that activity, sensory driven activity. So imagine you get born, you have some sensory driven activity coming through your eyes or whatever it is, which seems to be regulating, shaping the way the cortex is formed. That network, the circuit, the forming circuit, uh, you know, is, is formed uh, well. So that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, an interesting. Very interesting observation. So this is basically the summary of that. Uh, you know, I won't go into the uh, details of that because I want to move on to the next just uh, published work. Uh, NR2B receptors seem to be activated by the thalamic fibers predominantly, which actually mediate probably through some sort of a transcription regulation, uh, uh, calcium mediated phenomenon because they are have been shown, as I said, to uh, have a lot more calcium in, uh, and that allows for the proper uh, uh, not only morphological development, but intracortical connectivity of, of, of these interneurons. Now, uh, the, now uh, next, I'd like to switch gears and tell you a little bit about uh, this phase here. So I talked to you a little bit about the integration of interneurons, specific types, and uh, I'd like to focus now on uh, some forms of maturation refinement. And Donna, who is at the meeting, and he, uh, as well as others, uh, will have heard uh, this part of the story, because uh, that's, that's what I, I presented there. So this, in fact, phase of maturation refinement uh, has to do more with, with effector molecules, like molecules that uh, are, are probably sit on the membrane. They have to do with synaptic uh, maturation. 
uh, further elaboration of synaptic contacts. Once they have found, in fact, their partners, they seem to be uh, finding the right amount of, of, of excitation inhibition. Performing a screen in the, in the, in the lab uh, and looking at the possible effector molecules and transmembrane molecules uh, present um, uh, enriched, actually, in interneurons, uh, uh, one of the genes that came up as, as being enriched is CATNAP4, or otherwise CASPA4. This stands for Contacting Associated Protein 4, and this was highly enriched in, 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 inter, in developing interneurons. So, uh, we were particularly interested in that gene because it's part of the Norexi superfamily of proteins, which are synaptically localized molecules, and have been shown to be very important for synaptic uh, formation as well as transmission. Second, because loss of, of, of these proteins, loss of function, and some of their synaptic partners has, has been linked to various brain disorders, such as, for example, the alpha-anorexis to autism spectrum disorders, and CATNA2, which is another family member in, in the same autism, schizophrenia, as well as epilepsy. So, um, we wondered whether there was any evidence for a possible involvement of uh, CASPA-4, CATNA-4, I'll be using the name interchangeably, so in, in, in the, uh, um, as a risk factor in developing neuropsychiatric disorders. And uh, looking at the gene, the gene actually sits in chromosome 16, as you can see there in the red box. This is the arrangement of exons and introns. And uh, looking at the uh, literature, what's published, we uh, identified four uh, cases uh, that people have shown deletions shown in red and duplications here shown in blue uh, in, in, in this log of this gene. Um, so uh, that was, you know, pretty good evidence, you know, that maybe it's a risk factor, but it wasn't that convincing uh, for us. So we actually wondered whether there was anything else uh, out there to be unearthed, and we uh, teamed up with a, a bunch of groups doing human genetics, and uh, through that collaboration, we were able to identify uh, eight more cases of CMVs, uh, uh, deletions in the gene, the CASPA-4 gene, um, uh, individuals suffering from a variety of, of disorders, uh, two with schizophrenia, two ADHD, two autism, that all, in fact, these uh, six ones sit in the second intron of the gene. And through a different cohort, we identified two exonic deletions uh, uh, in individuals suffering from autism. So that actually made us even more excited, excited to study the, 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 the function of the gene. And we turned, of course, into mouse. And, and uh, that would allow us also to basically test for causality. So if the gene was important you know, in shaping how the brain you know, develops and functions, then we should be able to see something in the, in the, in the CASPA-4 knockout mice. So uh, first things first, we wanted to see which are the interneurons uh, that express this gene. And to do that, we went into a slightly later time point, P21, where all the markers that have been used to identify them are expressed. And the, and the line of share is, in fact, uh, we found the share is, is, is held by a parvalbumin positive basket cells, as I told you, uh, you know, something that I've worked on before. Uh, here you see the PV cells in red uh, using a reporter line and a PV Cree line. And the GFP cells are the CASPA-4 expressing uh, cells. Uh, using a knock-in, knock-out mouse line. What's very interesting, I don't know if you can see from the images, uh, and was interesting to us was that in fact, even at this stage of development, there seems to be a developmental upregulation of CASPER-4. So as you can see, comparing B21 to P60, you see that about 60% or so, 63% of the cells, PV cells express CASPER-4. But if you go to a later time point, P60, uh, you see about 90 or so or more of the cells, of PD cells express CASPER-4. So that's an interesting developmental uh, period though, uh, that, uh, that, that tells us that in fact it could be that CASPER-4 uh, is important for the maturation uh, and refinement of, of synapses and stuff. And that's what I'll show you um, later. So the question we asked is, that, okay, PD cells express it. Where is it expressed? We need to know where it is, it is expressed subcellularly in order to be able to understand, uh, you know, uh, to possibly understand its function. So to do that, and failing to have a working antibody for immunos, we turned into two different methods, Western blots and this. Uh, this method is basically just uh, having cultures, cultured neurons, and uh, um, 
uh, and then applying uh, an FC tag Casper 4 protein onto the cultures, not penetrating the cell membrane, washing it out, and then basically staining for the FC domain. And that allowed us to basically, uh, we did that uh, um, in addition to doing Geffen staining, as, as shown here, uh, which is actually a, a postsynaptic scaffold protein expressed only and exclusively in gabaritic synapses. So basically, you can see here, if I zoom into this, you can nicely see the uh, opposition, almost colocalization. It's not like in a two photon imaging, but a nice opposition between the red dots, which stand for Geffrin, Gabergic synapses, and the Casper 4 FC, which actually is shown here. So that tells us that that domain, Casper 4, seems to be binding to something which is localized in inhibitory synapses. But in order to understand where uh, pre and post synaptic compartments, and do it in a bit more of a global way, we turn it into, as I said, Western blots, and we fractionated uh, the, the brain uh, into a, a P2 total membrane, synaptosome, which ha has the synapses, postsynaptic membrane, presynaptic membrane, and actually performed the blotting as CASPO4. As you can see here, CASPO4 is exclusively expressed in the presynaptic compartment, uh, 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 um, presynaptic of the cell. And these are some positive controls uh, uh, to show that, in fact, the methods works pretty well. PST95 is a totally postsynaptic membrane protein. Geffrin, as I said, the postsynaptic. There's a little bit of a leak there. But synaptophysin, uh, which is a presynaptic, is presynaptically uh, localized only in this experiment. So we know it's expressed by PD cells and that it's presynaptically expressed. Now, in order to be able to study its function uh, physiologically, we need to be able to target these cells. And to do that, as I said, we turn to genetics. Using a PV Cree line and an RFP reporter line, uh, we got from the Arbor lab and the, and the Costantini lab, uh, and the Casper 4 GFP line crossed together, we're able to, at P21, have cells that are PV only, have not yet expressed Casper 4, but will do so at P60, and yellow cells that, that in fact, uh, are Casper 4 expressing cells. And we performed three groups of recordings, paired recordings. So what we did is we went and cut slices and patched two cells together and, and recorded from the cells of interest in neurons and the postsynaptic cells that don't express Casper 4, which are shown here in preambular cells. So in the control condition, we're able to see cells that have not yet expressed Casper 4, but will do so. As I said, cells that will, sorry, cells that have already expressed. And in the knockout, cells that have never seen Casper 4. Uh, and when we did that in the control, in this case, uh, what we see, uh, we see that we patch onto these cells, evoke action potentials, we see that the uh, presynaptic cell fires a nice FS-like action potentials, fast spiking, as I told you before. The postsynaptic is a very regular spiking neuron, as expected. A single action potential now in the presynaptic cell evokes a nice and sharp postsynaptic response shown here in red. This is the average response, and these are the individual traces upon a repeated single you know, action potential depolarization. And this is, uh, you know, comes after a short delay, and the kinetics are very fast. When you do the same in the knockout, you see that there's no difference in the firing of the cells, but in fact that there's a significant reduction and disruption of the postsynaptic response elicited by these cells. So the average response is smaller, the kinetics are a little bit slower, the latency, you know, so from the occurrence of the action potentials to the release of the neurotransmitter and detection is actually longer. And I want to show you the overall data, and the reason for that is not to look really through the dots and stuff, but I want to show you the third group, which I don't have here, which is in fact um, these cells here, right here in gray. These are the cells that have not yet expressed Casper 4. So the hypothesis was, well, if Casper 4 is necessary uh, uh, for, for the full development of the output of these cells, it should, these recordings should look exactly like the knockout. And this is what we see. In fact, we see that they are very much like the knockout in, in terms of, of different uh, values, uh, um, which basically uh, bring, uh, which basically tells us that, that Casper 4 is necessary for the full maturation. But how does it do that? So I'm not, I don't have time to go into a couple of different experiments that we did for addressing presynaptic mechanisms as well as postsynaptic localization receptors. But based on the role of other uh, Caspers, 
um, cast of family members, we turn into a possible role uh, at, the, at the synapse. We know it's expressed presynaptically. We don't know what the partner is. So that, that's an interesting thing to follow up. Uh, so we turn into addressing, well, these functional defects that we see could, in fact, be explained by some sort of structural defect. So we turned into electromicroscopy, and we looked for perisomatic basket cell synapses, as I said, uh, that these cells form. And we did that in the wild and the knock. And what, what you can see here, I hope you can appreciate, I'll show you the overall quantification, is that we, by measuring two things, the length of the BSD and the width of the uh, synaptic cleft, we're able to, uh, to see that, in fact, the, the synapses look a bit more disrupted uh, in the in the mutant mice. And, uh, and with shorter PSD lengths, as well as wider clefts. And this is the overall quantification, the cumulative distributions uh, of, of, of more than uh, 60 synapses that we, we were able to identify and, and measure, uh, which shows you exactly that. And in fact, uh, this could be, um, uh, the structural defect of the synapse could be mediating almost exclusively the functional defects we see. And I, can, I can talk to you a little bit about how that can be. But we think that Casper Ford has a structural role at the synapse. Uh, so based on our findings on, uh, on the possible involvement of this gene in neuropsychiatric disorders, as well as uh, its involvement in the function of, of, of cells that have been implicated, such, such as the PV cells, we uh, started testing for some behavioral phenotypes in the mice, just to see. Uh, and we tested for some stereotype and perseverative behaviors, such as over grooming. Um, so for some locomotion anxiety, which is you know a, a general test, is to see whether these mice actually suffer from any of that. We use the open field arena and the plasmase and marble bearing, and some sensory motor gating deficits pre-pulse inhibition, which in fact uh, has been used even here um, uh, in the in the medical school in the in the hospital. Um, I forget the name of the investigator, but but it's been actually used uh, in human individuals uh, for many many years. Uh, and test for uh, deficits in sensory motor uh, control. Now, one of the things that I was, sorry, just to tell you that I'm not going to show you, but none of this actually gave us any data that was, you know, uh, statistically different between the mutant mice. So we don't think that there's any locomotion anxiety behavior uh, really overt in these mice. But what was clear to us is that there was a severe grooming behavior. So these mice, we actually took them, and at some point we scored them all here. Uh, we had a big colon at that point before it was wiped out by a uh, hurricane. And we basically scored them all from one to four, four being the most severe, having also body hair loss, uh, as well as you know uh, facial hair loss, as you can see here, three only facial, around the whisker, hair loss, and only whisker uh, loss. And scoring all this, you see that most of the mice seem to be having some sort of uh, uh, hair loss, both males and females. So that was interesting, and it's, it's something that we can talk more about um, at the end if you want. And the other thing that we found is, in fact, uh, that these mice have an unusual and abnormal startle uh, um, amplitude. And this is measured by, you put the mouse in the chamber, I don't know if you've done these experiments, put the mouse in, the, in a plexiglass chamber, you play a loud tone, you see how the mouse reacts by actually through a piezoelectric device, and you measure response in arbitrary units, and you see that, in fact, both the heads and the knockouts, in fact, startle more, seem to be reacting much more strongly to that auditory stimulus, but they don't seem to have increased anxiety, right, which is, which is interesting. So the other thing that, that, that you can test with that is PPI, the pre-pulse inhibition, as well. And what that does is it plays a pre-pulse before the main startle pulse. You have a, 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 a pulse that you, uh, you vary in intensity, 74, 82, 90. Especially in the 80 to 90 decibel pre-pulse, uh, this actually gives us an abnormal startle response. So that tells us how able the mouse is to uh, uh, distinguish these two uh, phenomena, like these two stimuli that come within 25, 50 milliseconds apart. That's why the, the premise is that they have a sensory motor gating deficit, but they're not able to detect these two stimuli as they should. So we know that they are defective in that respect as well. And in order now to uh, address whether any of these defects, behavioral defects, whatever it is that we've observed, could be of relevance to the cellular defects we have observed, uh, we tried, we hypothesized that, well, if we actually try and boost inhibition somehow, we may be able to, to rescue some of this. And to do that, to boost inhibition, 
we used Indipon, which is a positive allosteric modulator of GABA A receptors, uh, with high specificity for the ones that contain the alpha-1 subunit. And these, in fact, are the receptors that are enriched in the synapses given out by basket cells. So we know that people have done electron microscopy, immunoglobulin to show that. So we use this drug, uh, and we used acutely gavage the, the, the mice, uh, you know, with, with the drug or or a vehicle. And what we saw is, in fact, that we're able to rescue the startle defect. So the startle defect seems to be actually mediated by defective inhibition of the sort that we described uh, uh, before cellular. And that actually is a very interesting thing because this this is you know this is possibly a structural defect, a developmental defect. The mouse has grown. This is actually done in adult mice, like three, four months old mice, and you're able to just use this compound and see some amelioration at least of that of that behavioral defect, which I think is a, is an interesting um, finding. And there's some more on the grooming that we can talk more about. So the conclusions from this part is basically that CASPER 4, CASPER 4 is required for the proper functional, structural and functional output of PD cells. And that its loss in mice leads to behavioral phenotypes that could be of relevance to, to disease, since we think that this could be a rare risk factor for developing neuropsychiatric disorders. And through our collaboration, we're exploring that a little bit further uh, through Thomas Bergeron's um, group in Paris. So this is actually the end. Of, of my of my work, published and unpublished. And I'd like to spend the next five, maximum 10 minutes, I don't know if I have, five, 10 minutes, yeah, to tell you a little bit about the avenues uh, that I'm thinking of going towards uh, with this. So just to recap, this was work done on the integration and, and, and maturation refinement of just two you know, uh, types of cells, the PV positive basket cells and the nuclear from reading uh, cells. And even, uh, you know, this work actually just, I think it's just beginning to scratch the surface of, of how these phenomena, uh, you know, uh, are required and get implemented in, in, in the development of these just two cell types. Um, there are so many unknown factors uh, still that remain to be, um, you know, revealed. And if you think about the overall group of interneurons, which are over 15, about 15, 20 maybe so far, and one can imagine the expansion of, 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 of that work um, for years on end that goes beyond my lifetime. So um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I'm thinking of, of, of proceeding. So my general interest is, uh, as I hope it was obvious today, was to study the fundamental principles that control the development of synaptic connectivity in the neocortex. So basically, I'm talking about circuit formation. I'm interested in understanding how the circuit gets formed, uh, and with, a, with an emphasis and a focus on cortical interneurons. So three main questions uh, you know, that seem to be vague, but I'll go into some, 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 some ideas about uh, what each one of them is, is I'm interested in understanding the role of space and time in this phenomenon, in the circuit formation centered around interneurons, the role of transient cells, and the role of disease. And to start off with space, what do I mean by space? We know the work that I showed you today has been done on the somatosensory uh, barotheal cortex. So it's a sensory cortical, primary sensory area. But these cells exist throughout the brain, throughout the cortex. If you look in the prefrontal cortex, you look in the motor cortex, they're there. And they seem to occupy more or less the same position. So it's very interesting the fact that the Two areas which perform very different function, have very different structure and function. So motor cortex, for example, or prefrontal doesn't really have a layer four, uh, as, as the sensor it has. They're there, and nobody understands how the, the, the cells, the same type of cell actually develops in different cortical areas. So, so to what extent does it, the cortical area that a given type is, is embedded in influences its development and its connectivity? And at the, uh, you know, at the same time, these cells, although we've studied most of the superficial, are found throughout the cortex. Now, we don't know whether they are exactly the same cells. Based on many measures, they seem to be exactly the same cells. But you find them also in layer 4, the sensory. You find them in the deep layers. And, and it's a total unknown how uh, you know, these different, the same type develops in different layers. And we can actually start testing that by trying to change the position that a cell sits 
add. So for example, a cell that would sit in layer two, three, changes and shifts its position to layer maybe four or five. And we're able to do that by manipulating the, uh, the cell, uh, expressing a channel that I didn't tell you about, 32.1, and address how that changes its synaptic connectivity. So that's one aspect, space. What about time? There's two things that I mean by time. Again, these cells um, that you find in all layers yeah. are born at different times. So we know that they start being produced at E15.5 in development, and they finish their main production about E18.5, peaking around E15.16.5. So what's interesting here is to, uh, we studied the E15.5, E16.5 uh, you know, cells, but it's very interesting to see that different, the cells are produced at different times in the embryonic development to what extent are they being integrated and uh, embedded in the circuit in a different way? Because I think you might actually find some uh, interesting surprises there that it could be that the E18.5 ones that, that get to the cortex a little bit later on in the developing cortex uh, compared to the E13.5 ones find a bit of more of a mature and established network and hence they have to find different principles to integrate and establish uh, you know, um, um, connections. So that's one thing that I mean by time. And the other one is actually looking at the fine tuning of that uh, synaptic integration. So looking at how the synapses get uh, developed onto these cells. So looking at previous uh, examples in the literature, it's been shown that, surprisingly so, first synapses to come in are GABA. Right? GABA is supposed to be an inhibitor, it's a you know, neurotransmitter. But in fact, early in development, it's been shown that it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it depolarizes the cells. And that depolarization leads to the recruitment of excitatory synapses, recruitment of AMPA receptors and MPA receptors first, then AMPA, and then hence the formation of excitatory synapses. How does that interplay between, for example, uh, you know, in our case, you look at the subcortical input that we see versus the intracortical, we don't understand the principles of that synaptic development onto these cells. In a local, Phenomenon, you know, in a local way. So looking at actually the fine, you know, tuning, the fine, uh, you know, uh, coming of input. Uh, are they segregated to start off with the input? Uh, do they come in together at the same section? And then basically, some there's a win, you know, uh, um, winner take it all kind of uh, aspect where basically then, you know, the subcortical input maybe uh, wins out, uh, you know, uh, and pushes out the, the intracortical ones. And once you lose these. Then you gain some, we, we don't understand the principles of that. Uh, and also we don't know actually what are the downstream you know, cascades, the transcriptional cascades that could be activated through uh, you know, calcium, for example, mediated effect. So this is what I mean by space and time. And now moving on to the transient cells, uh, there are three major transient cells, which I find very interesting, present in the cortex. So as the cortex develops, these cells get generated and it's, it's not just, the, you know, they die off, right? But it's not just the usual wearing of, of some of the synapses or pruning or what's been shown before. In fact, uh, these are the three sources. These cells and those ones, the transit of the metergic the cells, get lost completely. From the neocortex, they're almost completely wiped out. So you have a population of cells which actually covers the whole cortex and has been studied by the Sandra Piranis group very nicely. And then at some point, you lose them all. And, and, and you don't know why that is, first of all, that you lose them, and what their function is. So sublate cells is one population, some of which remain in the adult, which sit deeper in the cortex. Transient, and in fact, sorry, I'll go back to this. I don't know if you remember that I showed you that there's some uh, labeling in the deep, uh, layer six, uh, you know, by, by rabies bearers. We, we think that some of these are actually these cells. Um, which is interesting. So they shoot an action all the way up to basically the developing superficial neurons. The transit dermatergic cells, completely lost, nobody understands their function, have been studied a little bit by the Sanders group in terms of cell cycle regulation. And a very interesting group of Calhoun Reggie cells, and I say very interesting because they're the ones that produce really early on. I told you about really most neurons, but early, these are the only ones that produce really. And in fact, it's one of the most studied, you know, it's a very well studied molecule, and there have been severe neuro, uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders basically uh, um, uh, related to uh, 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 the loss of reading. Uh, it's, it's, it's a molecule that's shown to be essential 
for the proper migration of, of uh, excitatory cells. So one of the questions, for example, is, as I said, what their role is. Do they form synapses with interneurons? And based on some preliminary results I've done with rabies virus following the synapses onto these cells, our neuroglyphrom cells seem to be connected. There was some poster actually on the, uh, on the meeting, the meeting about, uh, about that as well. And once you lose these cells, what happens to their synapses? Are they just pruned, or just lost, or are they redirected to other targets? Uh, and, and I think that will uh, get us at some of the principles about you know, why you need uh, you know, these cells. Are they just purely a scaffold, you know, or do they perform a function role? And I think they perform much more than a scaffold. Um, the role of disease, uh, I don't have you know, uh, an extra slide for that, but basically I hope it was uh, uh, you know, easy to uh, gauge what I mean by that with the cast before. How genes that are involved uh, in, in disorders, in you know, the developmental disorders, affect the formation of the circuit, because many of the genes are actually expressed early on. But some of these disorders, autism, for example, appears a bit later on, maybe at the age of two or three. Schizophrenia appears even later on. So early disruptions of the network, the circuit, and specific cell types can actually have an impact which is far more robust and, and, and wide uh, than what you see later on in, in development. Uh, so so um, uh, I'd like to leave you at that uh, with uh, the acknowledgments. Gore, of course, who's, who's been my mentor um, in, in, at NYU, and he's been a, a great guy to work for. Uh, Natalia DeMarco Garcia, with, with whom we did the, the first part of the work, the published and now the work that we're trying to with the rabies. Edmund, with whom I've done the CASPER 4 study. And Rashi has helped, and Sherman has helped with the uh, NFDA project. All the lab members, Ilya and Jody helped with, uh, with uh, some of the pair recordings, Ilya and Jody, with some stuff that I haven't shown you. Uh, in the other project, and some of our collaborators, for the agents, and the human genetics groups, which unfortunately I forgot to acknowledge here. The Gogos and Gary Gorgu group at Columbia, Hakan Hakonos' group at UPenn, as well as uh, Thomas Borgeno's group at uh, the Pasteur in Paris. So thank you very much. Last year I also came, gave a seminar. I think I I have more stuff now presented, but um, but I thought it would be a bit of a missed opportunity to present, you know, you know the, the work as a whole and how I'm thinking about uh, proceeding, you know, based on what I've done. Um, but I can, if there are no questions, I can. I want to give you more. Deep, so. <laughs> I have a naive question. About all these developmental uh, disorders, uh, do you think, do you see it in the near future that that will be reverted? Yeah. Are there studies, or do you have something like this in mind? Or you find a gene that uh, has a phenotype that resembles, you know, the jump in the pulse or the right. maze. Uh, I don't know what's happening right now, and if you have it in your what the future plans. Yeah, I. I'm not sure it's being done. You must know more about it. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a, a fully translational neuroscience, you know, a neuroscientist. But yes, I have dived into that whole field, and I think that's the hope. The hope is that um, at least some aspects of these disorders will be able to be reversed by uh, um, later manipulation. So because it's very hard to to but, see this, but study. But that, them. there must be plasticity later on, or not. Uh, yes, some people try to, you know, uh, address that issue in terms of enhancing plasticity. We know that there is some plasticity later on, but I think the key here is, is to be able to um, identify this as early as possible, as has been shown, for example, for autism. The earliest, you know, the intervention, the, the better the result. So I think if we're able to find markers, whether that be you know, through uh, imaging studies or biomarkers or anything, or genes, in fact, when genetics actually, you know, uh, proves to be even more useful than now, that 
they say, well, you know, there are some genes that, that we know that when disrupted, we know that lead to certain disorders, even in you know, prenatally screening. Uh, so I think the hope for me is to go as early as possible so as to have the best results. Um, now, you know, people realize that that's not an easy task as far as I know and understand. So I think the, 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 one of the things is, for example, with the, with the MECP2, you know, which is a gene you know, described and studied by Peter Zoffi and it's in the field. And if you have disruptions in the gene, you almost 100% have a, you know, a neurodevelopmental phenotype. They have shown that even in that respect in mice, they're able to revert certain phenotypes, uh, if not fully revert the mouse back into normal. And the data that I show here provides some also evidence for that, that even when you have actually a purely structural role, a role that it's not easy to amend, right? It's like, it's not easy to maybe fix that synapse to actually be exactly the way it was supposed to be, uh, because plasticity, as you said, is not there. It's not easy to revert it to be earlier developmental. By just trying to functionally understand what's going on, and trying, for example, you know, apply a compound like in Diplon, I'm not saying it's going to be in Diplon or it's going to save you know, the world, but like such a compound, you're able to revert the functional, some of the functional defects, and hence make, make things a little bit better. And in your experiment, the long term, I don't know how long term the administration was, but there was no difference. Accurate. Okay. For that, for the yeah. input, it was, it was accurate. It was basically garbage, waited for yeah. an hour, because it, was, it has been shown that it peaks in the brain after an hour, and, and then did the experiment. So, um, so I think, are you talking about? The structure I, I, I doubt that there's a structural rearrangement. We didn't do that experiment. That's an interesting thought, but um, I would be surprised if, you know, if, if it, you know, the structure, because, I mean, function affect, affects structure, structure affects, uh, affects function. So I can't say for sure no, but I, I would be. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering with regards to the transient sets, you just say uh, just not now, but maybe mm -hmm. in a word, and it's very interesting. Uh, do you have a more specific theory of what the role might be? Because it seems you might have done. Uh, I have I have some preliminary data and, and, and an idea that uh, you know I can't really tell you this is what their role is, right? Yes, I can, of course. I but theory. Yeah, I mean one 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 of the thoughts or hypothesis that basically there is a there is a there are reciprocal connections created during development uh, that are uh, good for the proper basically development of the cells involved. And so, for example, in the uh, Kahal retro cells and say neuroglyphon cells, um, I think that there's these neuroglyphon cells, possibly through also other interneurons, provide excitatory drive to Kahal retro cells, which actually then feeds back onto them through either proper synapses or through volume transmission of glutamate uh, and affects their migration, positioning, integration to the cortex. And, and I think once, the, what's very interesting is that these cells, in fact, have almost exclusively gabaritic synapses. So the Kahal retro cells almost never develop proper excitatory synapses. And they're always like glutamatergic, and they're always excitatory. So the hypothesis there is that, in fact, at some point, as the cortex and the circuit develops, these cells seem to be targeted more and more uh, to the extent that it leads to excitotoxicity of, of the Kahal retro cells uh, through that excitatory action of GABA, then you lose these cells. And that happens once these cells have found their position and what they're supposed to do. So you lose them before the switch, before the GABA switch? There is no GABA switch. Yes, you lose them before. So there's no KCC2 upregulation. You know. So yeah, you have the Kahal retro cells. So they're always, you know, they're always excited by the interneurons coming in and the forwarded circuit. And I think as as it builds, then they kind of signal, well, you're no longer needed, you know. And well, you perform your function, now you can leave. Uh, and then, you know, that happens probably after they have found some sort of 
They've established their own connections. You know, these are the types of issues that I don't know. Do they target other cells first? Did you specifically ablate them? Uh, yes, they have been ablated by uh, the Groves group. But the problem with the driver that they've used to ablate it is a bit more of a general driver, and the mice die. But what they have observed is just looking at the migration of interneurons, that there is a slight difference in the migration of interneurons. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting uh, area. I know Alessandra really is thinking about how you know, these cells, how they just spread out you know, all over the cortex and different sources. And, you know, um, it's great. So it could be that different sources, for example, or Kahalorechi cells coming from different points actually connect to different types of interneurons. And that could be informative for you know, what, they, what, what their role is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.